Dice Company contains fantasy violence, mature themes, and unapologetic bickering. No feelings were hurt in the making of it, but listener discretion is advised. Dice Company will always be free, but it's not free to make. Please consider supporting us on Patreon or Apple Podcasts and get access to our weekly roundtable show Extra Roll. Just follow any of the links in the show notes for this chapter. Welcome on and all to Dice Company, where a group of old friends weave tales of triumph, heroism and despair under the guise of playing Dungeons and Dragons. My name is Tom and I'll be your DM through the continuing adventures of the Order of the Heron. Order of the Heron, please introduce yourselves and tell us one fun fact about your characters. Hi, I'm Alex and I'm playing Augustus and Augustus is concerned that he rashly pledged himself to the Knights of Scarlet last week. And while that was very good at the time, he's worried that he might now spend the rest of his life doing traffic duty for the local police force of Deep Mond. Hi, I'm Charlie and I play Vanda Finnick. Uh, Vanda has many dreams and as many plots to match them. Surprisingly though, they aren't all what you might expect. They include start a successful chain of soup kitchens called Broth and Banter, own a fancy dress shop called Vanda's Heroic Swank, and become the headmaster of a finishing school devoted to unnecessary deception. Hello, I am Dave and I play Benny Quez. Obviously, Benny's been busy with this large battle, so he's not really been thinking about this very recently, but he is very delighted with the success that he had with getting a fish and having it cooked and having a delicious meal for everyone. And as a result, he's started to think of himself as a bit of a gourmet. That aligned with the fact that it's become clear that travelling with this party means they will have to move from place to place pretty frequently means that he's decided that he wants to try all the various cuisines of the continent. He's excited to travel to Nordskin, where he's heard about the roasted meats with various spices that are the regional speciality there. Yeah, he's he's excited to try different foods as part of his adventure. Okay, two responses to that. Firstly, Vanda is the group's gastronaut. Thought I'd point that out. Well, this is solid food specifically. <laughs> Soups cover the spectrum of (laughs) solid to liquid. (laughs) And my second thought is, if I was involved in a battle, would I say, sorry guys, I was busy with a big battle. It feels somehow underplaying the... I'm just saying that Benny wasn't, hasn't necessarily been thinking about this in the like most recent period of time on the adventure there's something that's been kind of generally on his mind he's not like he was distracted he was about to fire an arrow at the sister of mercy and i was like oh i'll tell you what that fish was nice just trying to make just trying to make it really clear that that's not not what happens hi i'm harry and i play tok an imposing six foot eight automaton uh tok has been reflecting upon the recent battle under their metal shells the humans are merely constructed of brittle calcium carbonate reinforced sticks and loose agglomerations of meats not accidentally damaging them is the difficult part describing them as meats is horrific i kind of like the if you were about to fight someone though and said not damaging you it's going to be the hard part that's bold <laughs> i love the fact that everyone's everyone's fact had a uh, food theme this week well, that's because we're exceptionally well organised and uh, put it all out, as usual. A rare piece of teamwork. Uh, I, I love the fact that your definition of everyone does not include Augustus. <laughs> 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 Don't worry, I just lift right out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're a Scarlet Knight now. You have to stay here in Deepmond while we go and have fun. And they're made out of food. Yeah, the only way that works is if Tok is a carnivore that eats people. You know, you couldn't be a cannibal, of course, because you're not a person, but you know what I'm getting at, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't Tok accused of eating people in the newspaper? More than Very once. early in the adventure. Yeah. Not eating, just crushing them against his face. <laughs> Cliff of a face, I believe. <laughs> I'm tired of Charlie signing his sentences condescendingly with sweetheart. <laughs> I, I preferred it before he was famous and he signed his sentences with Gary Pencil. <laughs> before we begin some housekeeping, we start with a reminder to check out our Discord community, which is, frankly, an amazing place filled with amazing people. Next up, we have the Dice Company Patreon, which is the only place you can get all episodes of Extra Roll, our roundtable discussion of previous episodes of the Dice Company Adventure. But now, on to the big news of the week. We are proud to announce, for the first time ever, merchandise. What? Wow. What a scoop. It's the first I'm hearing of this. (laughs) That's a hot lead. (laughs) (laughs) 
magnificent. On with the show. No? Yes. <laughs> Where do I get it? We're starting simple with T-shirts, coffee mugs, and a journal. Please check them out on our official website, dicecompanypodcast.com, and be one of the first to own your very own piece of Dice Company history. With that out of the way, onto the mailbag. Mathrock designer extraordinaire Shelby Cat asks... If you could have any guest star, friend, family, famous, dead or alive or whatever to join you on the podcast, who would it be and why? Uh, so that was a difficult one, because if you include dead, then I kind of want the opportunity to have a game with someone that you would otherwise not definitely not have an opportunity to. So I'd, again, I'd probably go for uh, Terry Pratchett or one of my favourite recently passed philosophers, Daniel Dennett. But if it was like a, a a living person who might actually appear on the podcast, maybe the guys from Shut Up and Sit Down. Uh, what Shut Up, Sit Down? Uh, Shut Up and Sit Down is a board games review site that has been going for many years, um, but it's pretty awesome. I answered this question on the College of Whispers podcast, which uh, anyone can listen to should they choose, and I would recommend. But then I'm going to give a different answer because I'm contrary like that. Um, <laughs> and I've realised that what I would really like is uh, I would like to play with J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and uh, I think that would be an absolute shit show <laughs> So you're in it for the chaos yeah, You want absolutely. things to be an absolute shit show Well, welcome to Dice Company <laughs> <laughs> It's all he knows <laughs> I think for mine I'm going to go with Dan Harmon Ooh, Solid choice Done. Also apparently a D&D player and I think his mind is full of amazing ideas. So that's my pick. It won't surprise you to know that I'm, that I'm going to go with something weird. So I'm going to go for Damien Lewis. Yes. Yes, Al. He's back. We're gonna, I'm going to talk to him <laughs> exclusively about the program Life with Damien Lewis that Dave has mentioned on the, sh- on the show. But I haven't seen it. And it will slowly <laughs> become clear to him that I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just think the the dynamics of that it would just play out beautifully. I just think it would just be pure gold, comedy wise. And also, Damien Lewis is a glorious actor and a wonderful man. And so, I think he probably wouldn't necessarily get horrifically annoyed with me, <laughs> but I'd give it a good go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all missed the right answer, of course, which should have been John Kerry. He moves the needle, <laughs> he people. Does move the needle. <laughs> he moves the needle of actual play podcasts. We've said it from the beginning. Nobody listened to us. There's a huge resource out there just doing nothing. Waiting to crown the kings of TTRPG. For me, it would be Dame Helen Mirren or Dame Judi Dench. Yeah, if you're going to steal my answers from College of Wits. I would also take Emily Axford, Abria Iyengar, Eric Ishii, Sam Regal, anyone from Critical Role, to be honest. I was going to say no uh, no mention of Gary Gygax or Dave Arniston. Oh. The, <laughs> the creators of role-playing games at all. Yeah, I just feel like they'd be a bit gribbly. <laughs> oh, do you know yeah. what? Agatha Christie. Ooh. I mean, one of the greatest plot writers of all time in, in a kind of live scenario. She's certainly very popular, yeah. I feel like we would reduce her to screaming ruins. One of the greatest plot writers of all time. We'd find our podcast extremely difficult. <laughs> well, in the Doctor Who episode with Agatha Christie, that worked out pretty well, didn't it? So it would probably be a bit like that. With the giant wasp. Imagine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, similar. Similar. Agatha Christie would do way better than a giant wasp. We have giant bees. Chuck, I really want to take that quote out of context. Just <laughs> us, us advertising the chasm between us and Agatha Christie, by the way. <laughs> yeah, the thing that really sets Agatha Christie apart from other mystery writers is that she can handle a giant wasp. <laughs> Also, I feel like it came under attack from Dom with some deep cynicism, but I don't know what it was. No, all I said was accurately and factually, Agatha Christie is a popular writer. Okay, I don't. Okay, deep cut somewhere. Massive burn. Get that. Don't understand the rest. <laughs> I don't like Agatha Christie books. Why? I don't think they're particularly well written. You have low self-esteem? No. What deep personal flaw in your character has led to this? <laughs> She wrote Pryro. Who I hate, so that's a terrible example. <laughs> I, I'm stunned. Pryro's annoying. Why is he annoying? He's amazing. He's a poor man's Holmes. The little Grassells. Holmes is good. I don't want to come out anti-Holmes here. Well, he'll be happy to hear yeah. you say that. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure Conan Dawes super pleased at my high praise. But <laughs> we're being sponsored by Big Holmes again. Al, back me up here. Father Brown. There's a detective story. Father for you. Brown. Oh, no. My favourite one's uh, Caves, of, Caves of Steel by Asimov. Read yourself some Father Brown. 
Uh, spectacularly good. I can't tell if that's a sarcastic recommendation. This is not a sarcastic recommendation. The Father Brown stories are wonderful. Noted. Agatha Christie also wrote Miss Marple. Woo! (laughs) 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 Miss Marple, also annoying. I don't know why you say these mean things. (laughs) I'm glad that that people really like Agatha Christie. Genuinely. I think that's awesome. I, I admire people's passion. And I like a lot of things that a lot of people wouldn't like as well and that's fine that sounds like the i'm sorry you were offended by what i said i am sorry you're offended <laughs> <laughs> it sounds sorry how much of this is staying in the show is it zero percent none, none of it no. <laughs> you're going off on a tangent <laughs> yeah shall we play some dnd <laughs> no we've got a second question yet oh back to the script our second question comes from paris Picard, who asks You've mentioned before that there'll be more one-shot mini-series with Dave and Harry as GMs. How are they coming on? Any idea when we'll get them? Uh, no, no idea. Thanks for asking. Uh, so I was, I've was i been working on mine over the weekend. I've Ooh. decided that uh, um, entirely phrasing a system from scratch was possibly hubris. And therefore I'm doing it. But I've decided to instead try and adapt a system that I've um, been, uh, been reading about after I watched a wonderful video by Shut Up Sit Down on... Uh, wild sea which is um in the vein of blades in the dark but fixes several of the key sort of game design issues that i had with it uh, in a way that i didn't even realize until i read the system so i might try and adapt that instead is it still sci-fi yes i i reckon it's it's uh, adaptable enough that i can twist it into any nefarious ends that i deem suitable and any idea on when the listeners will get it it depends when we can schedule stuff as well i reckon probably work I probably could do it in a month or so. One month to the minute. Let me just. Just, Why do I ever say specific? Never say numbers. Never give to. Listeners will get at them both at some point this year. Boom! Headshot. (laughs) Kill catastrophe. And remember if you're offered a seat on an airship, don't ask which seat. Just get on and enjoy the ride, like we're about to in the next chapter of Dice Company. Previously on Dice Company, the second battle of Deepmon ended the same as the first, with the Knights of Scarlet victorious. Having been instigated by the Order of the Heron, the battle saw the end of the threat caused by Warden Knox, the Black Hearts, and the Sisters of Mercy. With the battle over, Ironsteiger sprints over to the fallen Captain Kane and begins to dress his wounds. He barks orders to the other men who are still celebrating. Men, clear away these bodies, he bellows before addressing another group. You! Go into the city and make sure the rest of the mob have dissolved. If anyone is causing trouble, teach them a lesson. Beyond that, we offer amnesty to those who are in hiding. Everyone gets carried away when something like this happens. No point behaving like these scum if we can avoid it. And he kicks one of the bodies of the Blackheart. Tok is going to, uh, just an aside to Vanda next to him and inquire, Vanda, where will he find sufficient acid to dissolve the mob? Well... One can always find acid if one knows where to look, Tok. You two, get Kane into the keep. He's stabilized, but needs care. He gets to his feet and takes a deep breath before approaching Augustus. We did it. I can't believe we did it. You led your men honorably, Commander. They weren't following me, Sir Fabian. I haven't seen heroism like that in longer than I can remember. Well, I owe a debt of gratitude to my friends. I believe my my comrade Vanda here effectively incinerated <laughs> my enemy <laughs> during the <sorry. laughs> I don't understand why you're laughing, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to like I didn't have a f- non funny way of saying killed with lightning. <laughs> my comrade Vanda here helped us kill Warden Knock. Vanda slides into view. Augustus, you do yourself down. Was Nothing short of heroic, if I may say, your charge out of the keep. You're too kind, Vander. However, I think all members of the Order of the Heron have done their duty today, and I'm very glad to see the emissaries of Kale banished from this city. Indeed. And who is this? This is Jenny, my noble steed. Quite the 
warlike visage she casts, says Vanda, looking unconvinced. Jenny gives something that very much looks like a massive grin at Vanda. It gives him a lick. Hello, have, have that. <laughs> Vanda doesn't resist that. Ah, yes. Well, it would be wrong of me to turn down the pleasant greeting of another seemingly broken thing. Turning back to Augustus, what now then? Now you are bound, as it were, to this place. I shall discuss that with the commander, Vanda. In the first instance, I hope even the Knights of Scarlet will understand that I require some healing, perhaps some rest. Of course. It has been a chaotic day. By the gods, has it. But I have you to thank, Sir Fabian. You really must finish the accolade ceremony. The Tome of Oathsworn awaits you. But first, I wish to congratulate you. And he offers a hand to Vanda. I have not seen power like that since the time of the Lionheart. Thank you for acknowledging my humble contribution to this little unsettling fracas, says Vanda, stretching out his hand. I felt rather more empowered of late, though I say so myself. Vanda's head doesn't move, but the eye behind the mask swivels in the direction of Benny. You mentioned the Order of the Heron. Where are the other members of this elusive group? Ah, yes. Allow me to introduce one of the most important members of our group, Bellerophon. And Bellerophon <laughs> slithers out from Vanda's top pocket. It's quite the menagerie you have. Indeed, though our other members are also nearby. And Vanda calls to both Benny and Tok. Yeah, Tok's just standing right behind Vanda. And uh, as he calls to him, we'll just say, Yes, Vanda. <laughs> Vanda starts slightly, clearly surprised that Tok is that close. Ah, yes. And of course, there's the last member of our group, Joe. But Vanda, who is this Joe you refer to? He is not part of our group, is he not? Vanda points over Tok's shoulder to a piper who appears to be covered in blood. <laughs> he comes running over, still with the bagpipes over his back. Please, please don't kill me. Oh, I think we're past that now, Joe. You woke this morning on the wrong side of fate, but find yourself standing victorious. The Bannerman of the victors. Vander here is right. Everyone, myself included, were inspired by your backpipes playing throughout the battle. So congratulations on making the right decision and joining the side of right. And Einsteiger claps him on the arm. Everyone appreciates a man who kills his friends on principle. Joe doesn't respond. You just see his eyes widened. And he, he look, you can see the kind of the tear smudges down his cheek. And he just kind of looks around, desperate for help in this social situation. I'm a fairly adept judge of character. And I believe we're witnessing tears of joy. And I can't say I blame him. It's been a truly magnificent victory for us all. And I should extend my thanks to you, Master Automaton, the way you dealt with the Sister of Mercy. It was like something from a fever dream. And he offers a hand to Tok. Tok will look at the hand slightly confused and say, I am unacquainted with dreams or fevers. You know, you remind me of Sir Cog, the Automaton of the Knights of Scarlet. He stands guard over the Scarlet Keep. I notice you have tools on your person. And he addresses Vanda. Does your automaton have skills in artificing? Or at least the capability to fix things? Ock is a most adept fixer of things. Master Tok, I wondered if I could impress upon you one further favor, although you've clearly done enough already. Could you look at Sir Cog and perhaps fix him? Sir Cog is broken? He has not properly functioned for months. As a technical member of the Order, we did not simply wish to leave him hidden away somewhere, however. So he stands guard at the entrance of the keep, although he can no longer move or speak. Fixing automatons is within my capabilities. Did Sir Cog possess sentience? No, of course not. There are no sentient automatons left. Benny has been taking a moment in the gatehouse to kind of collect himself, but now uh, walks down to join the group and so catches the end of that conversation. He sees the state of Augustus, says augustus are you are you all right do you need um do you need some medical attention i think i do yes benny i'm i'm all right but i certainly will need some help i'm just anxious before i depart this place to understand one thing from the commander ask it 
Commander, how will you show the city what has happened here? People need to know of your victory, or they will assume the city is still under the control of the forces we have now vanquished. We shall do what we have always done. Go out into the streets of the city and address the citizens face to face. Very well then. Augustus, in the stories of the Rojan, victors gave speeches. The people were inspired. I think if a speech is to be given, the commander here is the man to give it. Commander, I have an ask of my own. Anything. I am given to certain rituals post matters that we have just witnessed and would like to administer last rites to the slain. Go ahead. I'll have my men clear the bodies when you're finished. My gratitude and talk if you would assist me. I would find that to be acceptable. Vanda sends a mental message to talk. We loot. <laughs> We're not worried about repercussions, retaliations, that sort of thing. This doesn't seem like the kind of thing the Empire's going to take lying down. We care not for such things. If the Empire wish to bring the full might they have to us, we shall fight them once again. The Empire is currently distracted by the orcs of the southern continent. Yes, I read the newspapers too. It seems the continent is at war. A battle on multiple fronts will divide their efforts. Dark times for the Empire. How sad. Uh, Tok will turn to Augustus. Uh, we'll hand him a small vial and they will say, uh, Augustus, this is a potion of healing. And uh, we'll hand him a second one and say, also for Captain Kane. He is injured, is he not? Thank you, Tok. Before you drink that, Augustus, you, you might not like this, but I've got an idea. And I click my fingers so that Lenny the dog appears from his bag of holding. Augustus looks suspiciously at Lenny the dog. And Jenny bristles slightly and comes in closer and brings her head in close to Augustus's shoulder, look, like peering out from behind Augustus at this threatening new arrival. Benny crouches down next to Lenny and says, look at him, boy. He's hurt. Can you help him? Can you help him, Len? And Lenny begins to hop and skip and jump his way towards Augustus. The Audioverse Acting Awards, that was that was before he started doing Lenny the Dog, isn't it? You know what, Dave? Why don't you go fuck yourself? <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Lenny the Dog approaches Augustus and gives him a good licking. Uh, Augustus sort of fights, but he's quite injured and he does want to be healed, so he doesn't fight that well. There is no healing. Interesting. Augustus fights harder and says, uh, Thank you, Benny. I, I shall take the more traditional route. Benny looks perplexed. It was a genuine attempt at helping. He's like, I wonder. That's odd. It worked before, didn't it? It worked on Banda, did it? It did. Because he knows you don't like him. And Augustus gives a sidelong gla- a curious glance at Vanda. Pure soul, clearly. And Vanda smiles with all three teeth. So Fabian, you need healing. Come into the keep. Einsteiger addresses Benny. It is a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for your help. Please come in if you need healing too. Yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not injured, but I could do with a rest. It's I know, it's exhausting, isn't it? A battle like that. It's you know a bit of time to recuperate would be would be good, thank you. Of course. And we have some tonic wine made by the monks from the mountains. Come. Hey, I, so I, yeah, I follow along inside. Vanda and Tok. Uh, yeah, so Tok and Tick will uh, will assist Vanda in, in sort of like moving and organising where the bodies are. Presumably we want to sort a uh, uh, friend from foe, uh, which should provide some cover for some uh, for some good old-fashioned looting the corpses. Can I have an uh, investigation check from you, Vanda, at advantage? That's a 13. Uh, sorry, Tok is obviously also going to guide uh, him by um, pointing out any valuable looking items he can see whilst carrying the corpses. Yeah. And he adds one. Uh, you begin to investigate the slain bodies on a mission to loot. Among the black hearts, you find some loose change, which totals 14 silver. On the Sisters of Mercy, they carry very little in terms of personal effects. There's no money. Each of them carries a simple whip and a sickle. But as you lean in for a closer inspection of them, you notice a series of wounds and scars all over their bodies. Some of them are explainable by the fight you've just had, but some are older, having healed as scar tissue. 
As you look at the edges of their faces and all over their arms, the scars have a surgical accuracy to them. Mm -hmm. Vanda, you recognize these scars as those of an artist, similar to the scars on your body. Hawk, to you, the scars have been strategically made, and the lines follow similar pattern to the metal plates found on automatons. Mm. Vanda's face tightens with an undiscernible emotion as he holds the robes open to get a better look at the scarring. Vanda, these injuries appear to be non-random. They are uniform across the sisters. You are correct, Tok. It is a rare hand that can cause these marks. An art form of sorts, though of the darkest variety. Such behavior is not common among humans. Indeed, it isn't. Unfortunately... Such behavior does speak of so few on this earth that I fear I know who may have made these particular carvings. He goes by the name Joseph. Thunder, you have named this individual before. He is on the side of the Kalian Empire. The Sisters of Mercy are on the side of the Kalian Empire. It is often the way, Tok, with the purest of evils, that the damage they do is done to friend and foe alike because such damage also contains a power of sorts i do not pretend to know exactly what joseph was trying to achieve in this instance but it alludes to something darker than even i would consider as a yardstick for your understanding perhaps some intention behind the surgery was left behind under the flesh I take your meaning. We could investigate, Vanda. Vanda casts around himself without moving his head, work out who would see if we were to look more closely at the corpse, shall we say? Your passive perception is high enough to be able to glance around the area. The knights are currently lifting old corpses and bodies out of the way and none of them are paying you any attention because they've been informed that you're performing last rites and they wish to give you the space and time to do that without them interfering. I agree, Tok. If you can achieve this subtly, a small examination may reveal much. Subtly, okay. Tok will uh, take out a, um, a, sort of a, a smallish cleaver from his bag. Panda. I have not attempted a dissection of a human before. Indeed. Well, it appears there are firsts for everything, then. Okay. If, if Vander's not taking the lead on this, then uh, Tok is going to do his best to uh, to try and investigate within the uh, the flesh. Tok will, uh, will cut along one of the lines um, to see if there's anything implanted beneath. Give me a medicine check, please. Uh, this is not Tok's specialty, I find out. A six. Hawk carefully lines up one of the bodies of the Sisters of Mercy, pulling out a meat cleaver. Vanda, you see him lining the cleaver along the line, ready to make an incision. And then his hand goes directly up in the air and comes back down as blood oh. splatters everywhere. And he just continues to hack at it before then peeling back the skin. Good God, Birkin hair. What is going on here? Having peeled back the skin, you find very small platelets of metal under the skin and above the flesh that follow the lines that you've cut along. So uh, would these provide like armor, basically, or are they sort of more arcane? They look like a form of armor, similar to the plating that automatons have, but underneath the skin. Hmm. So it isn't visible. Banda, I believe these metal plates are not common among humans. They may provide armor, although chain mail would be, appear to be more efficient. No, indeed, they are most rare, and clearly in this instance designed to afford the owner an extra layer of protection. Vander examines the wound more closely, and at this point, I would like to use one of my abilities, please. I would like to use my researcher ability to see if I can discern more about what we've just seen. Roar. Having a closer inspection of the small platelets of metal, using your previous experience of anatomy and torture and the Empire as a whole, you come to believe that this appears to be some implementation of creating a hybrid between a human and an automaton. And because he's made such a mess of the incision, you can actually see part of the bone, which has runes carved into it. 
these are Alokian runes that offer a different type of magical protection as well. Very like the Empire, Vanda mutters, to make the very thing they banned others to even attempt. Let me tell you a little more of Joseph Tok. He is not a man. He is the purest embodiment of evil I have ever encountered. If he has indeed been the master of this art, then I tell you now, he did not see these people as humans, but more as property. And Joseph does not simply release his grip on what he regards as his. I think we should tell the others what we found here, as I imagine Joseph will not be far behind this work. Before we do, though, I think we need to take the bone with the runes that we see. Vanda looks rather nervously at Tok. I might do this part myself, though. And he awkwardly gets down to be close to the bone in order to extract it. Go give me a medicine check, please. 24. (laughs) I'm a surgeon. (laughs) (laughs) Pulling a small dagger from your robes, you make very quick incisions and just remove a perfect section of the bone which has one of the Alokian runes on and slide it into your robes. Vanda looks up at Tok. Not my first bone removal. It appears a simple process. Vanda, should we remove all three of the bodies? If Joseph intends to recover them, we could deny him an asset. An interesting idea. And thank you for the compliment, you butcher. That is incorrect, Vanda. I am not employed as a butcher. A comment I can believe with little incredulity. Now, I think we should loot the remaining figures of prominence here and then make our way to the other members of the Order. I would find that to be acceptable. Uh, Tok will just straight up gather the uh, Sisters of Mercy and put them in the bag of holding. Fortunately, the Knights of Scarlet are not watching as Tok opens the <laughs> bag of holding and just very quickly just slides the remains of the three Sisters of Mercy into the bag, closing it and placing it back on his hip. I mean, I, no, I have no <laughs> comments about anything that just happened. Okay. <laughs> Banda and Tok, as you continue to rummage through, uh, you find yourself looking through Warden Knox's remains. On his person, you find a coin purse with 20 gold coins in it. You find a book which is stuffed with maps, sketches, and blueprints. Ah. And you find a rolled parchment with a broken wax seal which bears the emblem of the Emperor. Mm-hmm. Banda unrolls the parchment. And it reads, Nox, Operation Small Gods is in effect. Eliminate the non-believers, and in the chaos, take the Scarlet Keep. With the Knights of Scarlet eliminated, bring the trainees from Goresh to bear on the city. Test their metal against any remaining knights, the clerics, and themselves if necessary. The victor shall ascend to the vanguard. Make sure she arrives in Slateholm before the 15th of Harvest Tide. This is your path to Commander of Deepmond. When you have control, destroy the statue of the traitor and have the head sent to me in Lunadine. Do not fail me. Let her touched by the hand of the Emperor himself. Banda relays the information from the parchment to Tok. It appears we have once again stood in the way of the Emperor's designs. How delightful. And uh, do you believe the Emperor referred to the sisters as the trainees of Goresh? I do, Tom. I think it best now we make our way to the other members of the Order. We have much to discuss and plans to make. I would find that to be acceptable. Before they do go, though, um, Warden Knox was wearing full plate, was he not? He was. Okay, so Tok is currently trying to make himself some um, uh, some half plate. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, pilfering some of that would maybe speed up progress. Obviously, it's difficult to take uh, full plate off someone in, like, a field. So, Ward Knox goes in the bag as well. Have you considered deboning him? <laughs> that might make, make it a bit easier. For the love of God, don't give him ideas. We'll wait till later. <laughs> the armour will just slip off. <laughs> the calcium carbonate sticks and loose agglomerations of meats will uh, be easily removable. <laughs> <laughs> As you both stand up, Tok once again opens the bag, slides Warden Knox's remains into it, ties the end, place it around his hip, and the two of you head into the Scarlet Keep. (laughs) 
Augustus and Benny, you are led into the keep by Commander Einsteiger and surrounded by Knights of Scarlet. As you enter, Einsteiger raises his voice to the knights before him. Men, it is time for the accolade of Sir Fabian. The Knights of Scarlet fill the keep in two well-practiced lines, forming a pathway to the shrine. Sir Fabian, it is time to properly induct you into the Knights of Scarlet. I can see no better time to do it than now. Augustus definitely doesn't disagree with that. He He's obviously right. At this stage in proceedings, Benny is looking quite amused by the discomfort on Augustus's face. And he's just having a lovely time. And Lenny's still out of the bag and he seems to be having a nice time as well. So is Jenny. And Missy the Raven is on Benny's shoulder and she seems to be having a nice time too. <laughs> Hard to tell with the Raven, but you know. The full menagerie is there. Yep. Einsteiger bids you kneel by the shrine. Augustus kneels. Einsteiger takes his place at the head of the pathway next to the shrine and addresses you, Augustus, and the rest of knights in attendance. Newcomer, heed these words. With sword and shield, with heart and soul, you pledge to uphold the honor and integrity of our order. You vowed to defend the cities of people too weak to defend themselves, to stand against injustice, to champion the cause of righteousness in all your endeavors. May the flame of courage burn bright within you, guiding your path and illuminating the darkness. By the sacred oath you now swear, you become a beacon of hope in a world besieged by strife. As Einsteiger is speaking, Benny just kind of taps the knight he's standing next to on the shoulder and just very quietly mutters, Hey, pal, what's up? Is there a religious element to this oath? Sort of. We all have to follow a god, but it isn't defined to be a specific god. Okay, thanks. Do you follow a god? No. No? What, no god? Well, no. And gives you the side eye. Fair enough. I gladly take this oath, Commander. Thus, you are to become a questing knight. Go forth, find a place where people dwell, and defend it with every element of your being. Let your actions speak louder than any words, for you are the embodiment of valor, the guardian of the innocent, and the pure pride of a knight of scarlet. At the conclusion, the two lines of knights draw their swords and Flash them together three times and cheer. And he knights you once again and then offers his hand to you to raise you up from a kneeling position. Augustus takes it and exchanges a bone-crushing handshake with Commander Einsteiger. And there are huge cheers around the keep with the line remaining in place, Augustus. As you turn around to greet your fellow knights, you see Vanda walking alone towards the pathway up to the shrine. Ah! Sir Zeno. Sir Fabian, Vander. Ah, yes. Sir Fabian. How silly of me. Have you ever desired to be a knight, Mr. Finnick? Vander appears to search his thoughts for a second. No. And yet you fight with the bravery of one who should, says Ironsteiger. Speaking of which, and he reaches into a satchel that he has, and he pulls out some dusty medals, says, You have more than earned this. And he goes to place a medal, Vanda, on your robes. Vanda puffs out his tiny chest to receive the medal, as clearly the glam that that represents has tickled a deep, sensuous part of Vanda's soul. Turns towards Benny, and you deserve this too. And he goes to place it on your chest. Uh, right. Cheers, I suppose. Tell very much. He clips it on. We can't all give inspiring speeches, eh? And he claps you on the arm. And where is Tuck? I think he went to fix uh, your automaton. Marvellous. When he returns, I shall make sure to give him his medal as well. Not having sentience is no excuse for not reaping the benefits of glorious bravery. And a nudges, Benny. A decorated admiral now. Yeah, all right, Thunder. And when Einsteiger has turned away, Benny surreptitiously takes his medal and puts it in his pocket. Sir Fabian, with the accolade ceremony now complete... We must enter your name into the oath-sworn tome. Very well, Commander. He goes over to the shrine and he pulls out a huge, massive leather-bound tome. And he opens it up. As you will notice, every member of Scarlet has their name enshrined forever, along with a list of all their deeds. Every knight is given five blank pages to fill with their glory. Some require more. And does this get, you know... 
posted out anywhere? Could we could we make it any more highlighted that our group definitely ain't dead and definitely remains a thorn in the side of the Empire and should be followed to ends of Earth as far as possible? Or, you know, or do you just keep it to a, a book? It is kept to a book, a book that is kept forever in the keep. We do not shout about members of the Knights of Scarlet to the whole world. The armor and regalia should say all it needs to. This is simply for our records. Will Augustus here be expected to wear the armor and regalia? Of course. Of course. Of course. Benny's, Benny's back to enjoying it after being a bit <laughs> a bit harumphy for a moment. Uh, thank you, Commander. My friend raises an important point. I should not like my true name to be known beyond this city. And since only yourselves, the Knights of Scarlet, and our enemies who lie slain around us have heard it, I would appreciate it if you keep this book and my name secret. Give me a persuasion check. More charisma. More charisma. Nine. Not much more. (laughs) While I understand your hesitance, there is a way to dispel your worry. An old practice with precedent. You could be listed under a name of Valor. It is the practice we last used for the Lionheart to conceal his true identity. Very well, Commander. I accept your offer. Uh, and Augustus glances at Vander. <laughs> Dreadlude. Uh, Radagard. Steve Heron. Could be Radagard. Sloom. The Sloom. Lord Sloom. Commander Einsteiger, I should like to be entered simply as the Heron Knight. I like it. And he begins to write the words in beautiful calligraphy. And I shall put your first deed as victory in the second battle of Deepmont. Thank you, Commander. Be sure to add that alongside your own name and those of the the other men here. Of course. Some of us have fought in both. Commander, may I ask, are you now, in effect, the ruler of this city? That is an interesting question. I believe I have always been the ruler of this city. I am just now acting like it. Very well. Well, might I suggest that the Temple of Kale ought to be realigned in favour of a different deity? I think desecration of the Temple of Kale shall be job one. But in the morning, I think we've all deserved a rest and a break. Very well, Commander, I agree. When you come to reconsecrate the temple, there is a very good priest of Tyr in the woods to the east of the District of Small Gods. I wonder if you might seek his counsel. Of course. What is his name? His name is Pontus. I shall make sure to seek him out. Clerics are always useful people to have around. I think that the values of Tyr align well with those of your order and the oath I just took. Agreed. Einsteiger then reaches beneath the shrine and he pulls out a dark green bottle filled with a kind of brownish liquid along with some goblets and he begins to pour them out. This gentleman is Akfast and he offers it out to the three of you. We drink to the oath sworn here today and to our victory. And raises a gnarled hand. Yeah, Benny also raises an, a non-gnarled hand. Show off. To victory. Uh, and Augustus nails down his drink in one. So does Iron Steiger. So does Vander. Yeah, Benny feels a bit obliged now. Commander. Yes. While we are giving out medals, I wondered if I might propose a further reward. How so? Boy was struck down in the market today. He was the first to raise arms against the villains that patrolled these city streets and is deserving of the highest award you may bestow. I see. Very well. That is truly an act of evil. I will make sure that he is buried with full honours, and he shall be gifted the Scarlet Heart. My gratitude, Commander. And he looks at Vanda with a hint of suspicion as to what's come over him in terms of, like, honouring this child. He suspects there might be something more to this story. I wonder what that act of evil was. <laughs> and his face remains inscrutable, though Benny must get the impression that he is nevertheless being looked at. You have stopped to fix Sakog. Indeed. So Tok is going to try and uh, bring Sakog back to his usual function, but with additional functionality. Tok's idea is basically to try and um, 
introduce uh, additional kind of commands into his uh, into his memorandum crystal. So he wants to um, to essentially turn Sir Cog into an informant, uh, less of a spy because the knights are our ally. But uh, the idea is he's going to use the um, the sending stone and sort of adjusting Sir Cog's processes to make Tok an additional sort of master and have him report back of like news and stuff. Fantastic. We can absolutely do that. So you take Sir Cog into the empty room to fix him as you were asked to do by Bastian Ironsteiger. Give me a Tinker's Tools check. All right. Uh, he will, of course, guide himself. <laughs> that would be an 18. You've worked with so many automatons that it's relative child's play to fix the problems with Sir Cog. As you investigate his cranial region, you discover that the Elephite crystal has been removed and left to the side. It has been enacted in the same manner as was performed on Vander's automatons back in Lunadyne. So a very simple fix, but clearly done intentionally. Mm. Uh, well, in which case, he'll, he'll continue on with the um, uh, with the plan, uh, but afterwards may have some questions. Give me a gem cutter's tools check. Uh, you don't get too many of those. I could say I didn't even know they existed until three <laughs> seconds ago. Uh, 21. A rousing success. So Tok is in a, a quest to acquire as many tool proficiencies as he possibly can. I'm on six. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, you are as proficient with the gem cutter's tools as you are with all the others. You're able to shape the memorandum crystal in order to create a subroutine within the brain of Sir Cog that treats you as a master along with whoever is commander of the Knights of Scarlet. Having achieved that, it'll uh, put the Elephite crystal back in its place, close up the cranial plates and ask uh, Sir Cog, have you achieved awareness? Yes, master. That is good. Can you relay the last memories. You see his eyes flicker for a moment. I was approached by a member of the Black Heart Division of the Knights of Scarlet. They asked me to lift my visor. Do you know their identity? I believe they were the Warden. That is sufficient. Please accompany me. We will go to Commander Ironsteiger's presence. Uh, and Top will turn around to uh, rejoin the rest of the party. I find this to be acceptable. Doc can't smile because he has no mouth, but if he did, he would. While the rest of you are drinking your Akfast tonic wine, you hear the marching sounds of Tok being accompanied by Tick and a third automaton, Sir Cog. Commander Ironsteiger, I have completed the repairs of Sir Cog. This is fantastic work. And he turns to Vanda. Your automaton really is something special. He is indeed, Commander. And now that you're here, Tok, please accept this medal for bravery shown today. And he steps forward to pin a medal onto your chest. Uh, that would be quite difficult because Tok doesn't have anything really pinnable. Uh, it's all just like metal. Um, uh, uh, Tok will, will hold his hand out to uh, to accept it. Is Tok not like a, a fridge? You could just like stick it to him. If he has a magnet, yeah. <laughs> Einsteiger kind of leans forward to pin it to your chest and just kind of pushes it and nothing happens and then he sees your outstretched hand. Well, it's, they'll have to do. But thank you, thank you. And he places the medal in your hand. So Tok will fashion a small hook and try and like hook it around one of the plates so he can, uh, so he can fit in. Magical tinkering? Yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you watch as Tok hangs the medal over a portion of his chest plate. Commander Einsteiger, what is the purpose of this metal disc? He looks at Vander and then looks back at you, Tog, and says, It is a representation of your bravery. I find this to be acceptable. I'm glad. Commander, Captain Kane was damaged in the fight. Do you wish for me to attempt repairs? He thinks for a moment, <laughs> looks at the blood splatter all over your arm from where you attempted surgery on the Sister of Messi's I think we can handle our injured man, but I appreciate the offer. Tok will uh, sort of assume his customary place uh, with Tok and Tick flanking Vanda. Gentlemen, where are you staying this evening? We are staying at the Mound by the Sea. I know it well. Doreen's still there? She is indeed a fine cook of fish, as Benny will attest. Fish? Yes, Benny. Did you just say fish? I said good fish. Oh, I did hear oh, the right. good. We just said fish. Fish. <laughs> fish. <laughs> yes, Benny slash Gollum. <laughs> My friend Benny here. 
Didn't you enjoy the fish, Benny? Fish. fish. <laughs> Today's fish is trout a la creme. Enjoy your meal. Fish. <laughs> I shall meet you there later, and we can toast our victory and Sir Fabian. Sorry, the Heron Knight. I shall bring your armor to you then. Thank you, Commander. I look forward to sharing another drink. It is customary, Commander, for admirals to receive a tricorn hat. Well, we are knights. We do not wear hats. But could, you could try the tailors in town. I'm sure they'll have something for you. Of course. Banda says, a mix of emotions creeping across his broken face. So while we're in town, Commander, is there uh, an armorer's or a, a weapon maker's <laughs> shop that we might find? Of course. We have armorers, tailors, blacksmiths. This is a fully functioning port city. Excellent. I was sort of looking for direct action. Of course. Do you have a map? I can tell you if you can remember. Uh, I haven't got a map, actually, no. Uh, Tok will produce his uh, tablet, which will have a essentially a picture, an aerial picture of the city. So we're, we're thinking Google Maps satellite view here. Wild. <laughs> and he highlights this is the Merchant District. The Merchant District is to the south of here. I would imagine they'll be closed for today. Right. Thank you very much. And I will see you all this evening. We look forward to it, Commander. And Vander turns, making his way towards the pub, whilst muttering, Augustus gets a full suit of armor, but not so much as a hat for Vander. Vander, there may be more items of power within the Temple of Kale. Do you think they'll have a hat? No. I would suspect it would be the tailors who would have a hat, Vander. I see. I have business at the tailor's. <laughs> and Benny's muttering to himself as well. He's uh, muttering, oh, he'd better be paying if we were having a drink with that blowhard all night. begin the relatively short walk from the keep to the market square. Whilst making our way back to the tavern, Vander wants to take a look through the book he recovered from the warden. Okay, you open up the book and you find a series of incredibly well-drawn maps. Halfair is obviously an exceptional cartographer. You flick through and find updated versions of maps of, of a lot of areas of Athlon, which are similar to the ones that you have aboard the Sterling, but are definitely more up-to-date from a chronological point of view. Also in there, you find a set of blueprints to a prison in the north called the Fingers. Is that upgrades, potential upgrades I'm looking at? So more modern versions of the maps that include the Kalian Empire. Got it. Okay. Excellent. In which case, Vanda nods appreciatively at the craftsmanship and turns to Tok. Tok? Yes, Vanda? I have just discovered the blueprints to the fingers rather fortuitously presumably short-circuiting a loop of the dm you mean warden knox was the thief very possibly i was wondering if you might make a copy of these maps that would be within my capabilities though vander the originals were promised to us indeed they were tok forgive my rather meandering way of approaching these matters but i rather favor a path towards deception in this case you'll be surprised to learn indeed if we make a copy of these maps and then pass the originals back to the map maker we may allay any suspicions of his that we still intend to journey to the fingers the blueprints were intended to be our reward for finding the maps vander Perhaps an alternate map could be our reward. An interesting idea, and one I will try to propose. Now the copies. I would find that to be acceptable. I will require some time. Banda dutifully hands over the book. Benny says, could we see if he's got any maps of Lumitor as a reward? Uh, Tok will leaf through the book to uh, see if there are any maps of Lumitor. There are indeed a series of very highly detailed maps of every one of the ten realms that make up the former kingdom of Cantioch. Uh, okay, so Tok will 
show the map of Lumaton to uh, sort of check and see how different it is from the map that we've got in the Sterling. Presumably there's been quite a lot of updates to Lumaton. Judging by the date on it, this map of Lumaton is around three years old. Interesting inquiry, Penny. What, may I ask, has piqued your interest? Just, um, just stories at Fellowship, really. I like to, um, I like to be able to imagine where all them stories took place, so I quite like to have the maps. A hobby! How lovely! Banda says, not looking convinced. And correct not to. <laughs> it strikes me, gentlemen, that any number of these maps may be useful. I do not like to find myself advocating theft, but returning them to the map maker, while the more honest approach might deny us the opportunity to use these maps for a great many good purposes. Augustus's logic is undeniable, Vander. I must say that I find myself in agreement also. What an intriguing day this has been, Augustus, slayer of evil. It is with a heavy heart that I engage in this skullduggery. But for you, the Heron Knight, I will of course oblige. Well, Vander, far be it from me to encourage you to compromise your ironclad principles. But I thank you for your flexibility on this occasion. I think this calls for a drink, brothers. So do I, Vander. Perhaps we could find an alternative means to pay for the maps. Or skullduggery. I, I think it might be a mistake to engage in a conversation with our friend the mapmaker, but perhaps we can leave him a payment, a, a handsome amount of gold or similar, as a compensation for his loss. Matter to be revisited after some refreshing drinks, I think. Uh, Augustus will definitely kind of put some money aside, maybe through the Knights of Scarlet, to make that payment, but I can see we're going to go on to other things. I find the night air rather suits me, says Vander, smiling, as he continues to make his way in the direction of the pub. Yeah, tough will follow along. Having made your way through town, you find yourself by the mound by the sea tavern. As you push open the creaking door, a wave of warmth washes over you, accompanied by a cacophony of laughter, music, and clinking tankards. The air is thick with the aroma of roasting meats, spiced ales, and pipe tobacco, blending into a comforting haze that envelops the room. Lanterns flicker on wooden beams overhead, casting dancing shadows across the crowded space. Patrons huddle around rough-hewn tables engaged in lively conversation and raucous games of chance. Behind the bar, Doreen bustles away, pouring drinks. There's a sense of camaraderie and warmth that permeates the atmosphere, welcoming all folks to it following the victory over the Black Heart. Benny looks around. He feels exhausted, but still there's a bit of adrenaline flowing through the old veins. And he says, it's all right here, isn't it? It's nice. What do you say to, I don't know, maybe sticking around for a few days? Just, you know, exploring town. Yes, I may have some news as far as that plan goes, Benny. Perhaps some drinks first. Is this another one of those, we can't have nice things, bits of news, Vander? I would want to ruin the surprise. Drinks it is. Creme de month, please. Ale, please. No creme de month. No problem. And Doreen begins to bustle behind the bar to get your drinks ready. In the corner, there is a free table, which you can sit around. And as you look around, all of you notice, sat in the opposite corner, is Halfir, the cartographer. Top tries to uh, to pick his way through the crowd to the table without damaging any of the uh, delicate uh, bones and uh, agglomerations of flesh of the, uh, the humans and various biological life forms in the room. Fortunately, your agility is neither here nor there as the patrons all get out of your way as you march <laughs> through. <laughs> you do overhear a few people mentioning the name Tok, uh, along with the phrase, Hero of the Battle of the Scarlet Keep. You guys sit at the table. Halfair has not noticed you. Tok has been too subtle. <laughs> Brothers, I have some news I wish to share. Yes, Vanda. We've moved on from gentlemen to brothers, I see. That's an interesting turn of events. But uh, yeah, carry on, Vanda. Indeed we have, Benny. A mark of our deepening bond, I suppose. Now, when I was performing the last rites for those poor slain folk on the battlefield, I made a number of discoveries. As you now know, I recovered the book 
that now contains the blueprints we desired. Banda lowers his voice at that point. Classic last rites. Very good. I also made a rather unfortunate discovery. It appears to my eye that the Sisters of Mercy were, and how should I put it, augmented. I too was a guest of the craftsmen who performed such changes to the body, as my broken form attests. Vanda, do you have metal implants within your body in a similar manner? What? I believe I was an earlier model. But my point is that this is clearly the work of someone I know something of, the High Inquisitor, Joseph. I cannot imagine what Joseph was truly intending by his work with the Sisters of Mercy, but I am sure that it is no good thing, and that he is likely to be nearby. For that reason, and to your point, Benny, I suggest we don't linger in this place. Joseph is an uncompromising and detached soul, not someone we wish to meet. Metal plates under skin. Macabre, isn't it? Indeed. You may observe, Benny, and uh, Tuck will um, reach into the bag of holding and uh, surreptitiously <laughs> drag out, like, um, a bit of an arm and uh, show one of the scars. Uh, it, he's going to do this relatively subtly at the table and then put it back in. Give me a slight hand check. Oh, my and God. Fifteen. With surprising deftness, Tok pulls an arm out. <laughs> Out of the bag of holding. Augustus, you recognise the pattern of the scarring on the wrist that Tok has just shown. Uh, they appear to be the same pattern and design as some of the scars that you saw on Corinth's arm underneath his bandages. Gentlemen, there is something strange here. I met a, I met a traveller out in Roanoke, a broken and forgetful man who seemed to have suffered greatly, and he was scarred, and his scars... It seems strange to say it, but his scars were very, very similar to these. Were they fresh scars, Augustus? They seemed not to have healed, but it was difficult to say. He described being a person of Roanoke, a, a local person, and yet he did not seem to know of all the time that had passed since the fall of the, cit the Citadel and the destruction of his region. So both his, his mental and his physical scars seemed timeless in their way as though it could have happened a day a month or 10 years before I'm trying to think of timing wise the scars did not to my eyes appear to have been recently inflicted more that they were not healing the age of them therefore i i cannot really tell you but there were signs of a recent fight scarring wounds yes the link to the empire of these surgical scars a recent fight damage to the mind. Is it possible this individual was Morven, recovering from his fight with Squirrel? I do not believe so, Tok. But of course, we have never seen Morven's face. Indeed. It seems to me highly unlikely, a very different being in every respect. I have experienced this form of artistry up close, Vanda says, his head down. It is not something I wish to speak of in detail, but... If you ever find yourself faced by an enemy with a blade that appears to drag the light towards it, then know you may be in the presence of someone who practices this form of mutation. What is the purpose of it, Vanda? It has many possible purposes, but the Empire has clearly refined its methods. When I was acquainted with such artistry, I saw no amalgam of metal and flesh. That appears to be a later iteration of this new area of knowledge. The earlier work, if not to install some form of armour, what was the purpose of it? Not it, Augustus, but rather the man behind it. Joseph has a form of detachment. I do not believe that in my case he sought knowledge of how to improve. Rather, he appeared simply to want to explore the art of torture and take it, that art to its limits. What he discovered in later times is a matter I know nothing of. Vanda, could this be part of the Shadow Vanguard conversion 
that Squirrel referred to. Very possibly, Doc. It is certainly an unnerving development, to say the least. Banda, I worry that Kalen has suffered such treatment. It is possible, yes. We can only know by continuing our journey to the Fingers. Well, then I guess the question is, are we ready to head straight there, or do we need to do some more preparation? Well, and... Another option presents itself to me, my friends. If we believe this Joseph is in this vicinity, imagining himself among friends and in a city now in the control of the Empire, could this be a rare opportunity to find him exposed? Vander, I imagine this is a dangerous foe, but we have many friends and allies here, and he, by the sounds of things, may not, or at least not as many as he might expect. A trap, perhaps. I cannot lie that parting Joseph from his skin would give me great pleasure. Though, of course, embarking on such a course of action would be more dangerous by far than anything our little band has encountered to this point. Well, forgive me, Vanda, bloodied and battered though I am, but danger doesn't seem to frighten me at this moment in time. And in fact, I would relish a fight, especially with one as crooked and evil as this Joseph. Augustus, that may be damage caused by the recent battle. I will examine you. Thank you, Tok. It is possible that I am malfunctioning. And I will drink to your fine words, Augustus. And Vander raises his glass. Yeah, Augustus downs his latest creme de menthe. It's dulling the pain. Uh, Tok brings out like a little like pen light thing and does the classic doctor thing, checking for concussion uh, and stuff. <laughs> Augustus, you appear to be in satisfactory working order. Thank you, Tok. Very kind of you suggest then some acquisition of goods in the morning before a departure to the fingers and maybe a discussion as to how we might weave in these new developments of the High Inquisitor. Indeed, Banda. There was also additional information that Benny's contact provided. That's right. It was just if we needed to um, make any other stops on the way. Yeah, you reckon we got um, we could get some forged documents in Ru- uh, from Rook in River City. Uh, there were a custodian that could be bribed over in Whiterun, or a master thief who might be quite helpful um, in Sprig. Strikes me that, uh, I don't know, Vanda or, or Augustus, you might be the people to uh, um, have a chat with that custodian over in Whiterun, convince him to help us out, one way or another. I would find that to be acceptable. As you're chatting, Doreen comes over with a fresh round of drinks for you all, and then slams a newspaper on the table. I still enjoy these drinks. Always trickier to get booze when it's wartime. Oh, and she wanders off. Um, can we have a look at the paper? It's the Ovik Observer, and the headline reads, Peace and War. In an unsurprising turn of events, the Imperial War Machine has declared open conflict on the barbaric Grimson Reach. The trumpet of war echoes across the realm as the Sons of Kale are mustered and deployed to the Southern Front, ready to enact the will of the Emperor. More surprising, however, is a new peace brokered by the Emperor in an historic treaty with the realm of Lumitorn in Cantioch. While reparation payments were initially discussed with a number of the realms, few would have imagined the forging of an alliance, especially one which promises to reshape the landscape of our world. Lumitorn's ruler, the self-proclaimed King Erikson, originally from Athlon himself, has announced that he would be welcoming bounders to Lumitorn to keep the peace. In exchange, the legendary rangers of Lumitorn, colloquially known as the Blue Cloaks, will be sent to the new front line to the south of Fortitude. I am both struck that this is bad news for your hobby, Benny. Just then, the door bursts open and Bastian Ironsteiger walks in with Joe in tow. Uh, he sees you. Ah, friends. And all eyes on the bar are now on him, and they follow him as he walks over to your table. A Joe! How wonderful to see you again. He looks incredibly nervous and then looks to Ironsteiger. That's all right. These are the heroes of Digmond. You have nothing to fear from them. Everyone. Joe here, under the previous advisement, has become my bannerman. The knights will put him to good use. But what is the point of punishing someone for correcting a mistake and choosing the right side in the end? A finer player of the pipes you will not find. A fine choice, Commander. A drink, I suggest. This good news. Bannerman don't drink, Joe. Remember that. And Einsteiger takes one of the drinks off the table and downs it in one. In its place, he lays down a magnificent suit of armor 
identical in design to those worn by the Knights of Scarlet, complete with a Scarlet cape. This is the armor of the Heron Knight. I have bought it to you, sir. Thank you, Commander. I shall don it tomorrow morning as a new chapter of my life begins. People of Deep Bond, a cheer for the newest member of the Knights of Scarlet and the hero of the second battle, the Heron Knight. Following a loud cheer, you all notice that Halfie is now looking in your direction. Can Augustus just check, does his, do his three companions cheer as part of the adoring crowd? I'm afraid not. Uh, Tok will uh, look to the other two companions for direction. Sad. And after a moment, the cheers die down. I shall make sure that you are all drink free for the rest of the evening. Come, it is time to celebrate. And he heads to the bar and he's almost immediately replaced by Halfair, the tiefling cartographer. Oh, so you've You've stopped the black hearts, I hear. We have indeed. That's good news. Any any luck with the thieves? Unfortunately not, my friend. We did what we could, but as you'll be aware, the fight rather took everyone's attention away from our original plans. Give me a deception check, please. Can Top assist Banda uh, by um, saying the Knights of Scarlet are in possession of the city? Law and order will resume. A ten. <laughs> okay, brace yourself, talk. Well, I suppose it's good news that the Knights of Scarlet have retaken control and law and order will maintain. Perhaps they will prove more fortuitous in my search of my missing documents. I have to say it's a little bit disappointing that you were unable to come through, but, well, I suppose thank you is in order for helping rid the city of those bastards. Um, enjoy your evening. Fine words. We wish you the best of luck in your endeavours to recover your maps, sir. And he slinks off and actually leaves the tavern. Classic natural one on his insight <laughs> ability. <laughs> it takes him three attempts to find the door. Yeah. <laughs> Banda leans to talk. Rather lucky, talk. I thought he might have to join our friends in your bag. But, Vanda, there is no oxygen within the bag. He would suffocate within ten minutes. Quite so, Doc. Uh, you can see Tok looks a bit puzzled, but uh, he goes with it. Uh, Vanda, give me a perception check, please. Fourteen. As Einsteiger begins to ply you all with drinks and the atmosphere in the bar begins to reach something of a frenzy. As the cheers sound around the pub, Vanda slithers to a seat next to Benny and leans in close. Well fought today, Benny. As is so often the case, Benny glances at Vanda to look for signs of sincerity or otherwise. Seems to be just a straightforward statement. So he slightly surprised. He says, um, yeah, thanks, Vanda. Yeah, you too. That, that lightning bolt was summit, wasn't it? Not seen that before. It certainly was. On the subject of that lightning bolt... I confess I have been feeling a great deal stronger of late, shall we say. How are you feeling, Kitty? How am I feeling? Well, <laughs> that's a question, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's been a bit, a bit of a roller coaster. I mean, I'm all right, I suppose. Yeah, all things considered. I wondered if you might be feeling stronger yourself. Maybe more alive, more attuned to the environment around you, perhaps. Benny takes a moment to think about this. I don't know. I mean, I suppose me, my powers are increasing a bit, starting to get them under control. I sort of put that down to training I've been doing with Serafina, though. You know, starting to try and harness all that's going on. Indeed. And do you feel this? And Vanda reaches out and takes Benny's hand. Feel... I don't know, Vander. Are you doing a weird handshake? Are you doing your heron handshake? Vander's face. Vander's face is one of glee. Augustus, is this a human mating ritual? I sincerely hope not, Tok, <laughs> but let's see what happens. I don't... I'm not sure I know what you're driving at, Vander. Benny, you feel a slight crackle of electrical charge between your two hands. I'm feeling that Benny pulls his hand away sharply. The what? Yes. What was that? Is that me? Or was that you? It was us, Benny, Vanda says with glee. Is this because I fireballed you by mistake that time, Vanda? Are you trying to get me back somehow? 
It isn't unrelated, though I promise you, Benny, I mean you no harm. It is a little-known fact of the Rojans that we have always been stronger together. It has to do with the flow of the forces that give us our abilities, however they manifest. Now I, in my current state, may be more attuned to feeling the benefits of our closeness. You may feel less of this as someone newer to the art, but I assure you, it is there. I mean, what I'm hearing is that you need me. We need each other, Penny. I told you that you would be most useful, and here you are, fulfilling that very promise. Well, Vanda, as ever, I am delighted to be of service to you. Um, but, though I hate to admit it, there's probably something in what you say, in the being stronger together and all that. Yes, Benny. One might say, brothers. Don't, don't push it, Panda. If I, we're having a nice moment, don't take it too far. Of course. Regarding nice moments, I do acknowledge that we have our differences, no, Penny? Which leads me to ask a question of you. A question brother to brother. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I knew there was going to be some of that. Indeed there is. In the spirit of brotherhood, I am still curious about your reticence regarding Tiram Tenrace. Why, when you had the opportunity to fulfill your destiny as I would see it, did you choose another path? But Vanda, Tiram Tenrace was killed. Yeah, it was an accident. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't meant to happen like that. He, he fell. He did. Then he eyes deeply. The thing is, Vander, you know how I told you about, about Leith, Tamrace? I mean, the story I told you about Leith, it were, it were mostly true. But I think it's the story that the story that I kind of made up for myself rather than the whole truth, if you know what I mean. I'm familiar with the concept. Fact is, you know, it was true, Leith were a spoiled rich kid without any friends and he latched on to us gang, but we weren't we weren't really friends. I would spot an opportunity, I were using him to be honest. Got access to his books, his library, his cash, we were pretty free spending. And uh yeah, we're just uh I were just using him. And uh yeah, the the story about how I got this scar and how he lost his ear, that one I won't quite what happened either. He just caught me nicking stuff. He just caught me nicking stuff out of his library. I'd been through all tomes and all the grimoires, getting some good stuff, and I'm not proud of this for professional reasons, but he snuck up on me. And I span round and I felt an hand on my shoulder, reached for my blade, and uh, yeah, and then he cut back. So yeah, um, when Tiram were there in Bathhouse, I think I felt like maybe I'd done enough to tamp race family, to be honest. I felt like it didn't want to, didn't want to do any more. Well, that didn't quite work out, did it? You feel shame. Yeah, that's um, that's probably the word. Well, Benny, thank you for sharing the truth with me. And let me say, the world is full of shameful acts. And we must all engage in the realities of our situations. But it is also true that every Rojan has a destiny. And I would imagine that somewhere in your future... There is more than room for you to compensate for anything you've done in your past. Yeah, we'll see. Future's not turning out quite how I imagined it might. I've got to be honest, so getting a sense of what's next. It's not easy at the moment, is it? Ooh, the lives of many Rosians have been short and brutal, but never have they lacked interest. And suddenly... They have never lacked for the chance to do what is ultimately right. Well, I'll drink to that. To not lack an interest. The dullards everywhere. And Vander raises his glass. I didn't think you'd want to drink to doing what's ultimately right, so I thought, you know, I'd just go for the first bit of that. For the cheers. I belong to the other half of those Rogans. And Vander drinks. <laughs> Having cheers to one another, you look down and open the newspaper and you see a small headline on the second page, which reads, Justice for the Innocent. The date has been set for the trial of the decade, 
Kayla Lux, the recently discovered Rojan traitor and criminal, will stand for trial in the Fingers on the 16th of Harvest Tide. His alleged crimes of rabble-rousing, treachery and treason will feel the full force of Imperial justice on that date, with the verdict and potential execution delivered on the same day. If Kaelin's trial is on the 16th of Harvest Tide, today is the 6th of Harvest Tide. I estimate six days travel to the Fingers from our present location. We will not have much time to bribe the custodian in White Run. It appears that fate marches towards us then, Benny, Banda says. Yep, more interesting times ahead by the looks of things. I don't suppose Warden Knox will be needing his sword anymore. Indeed. To good drinks and great adventures. Vanda raises his glass one last time. And with you all drinking, and with the continuous chance for the Heron Knight ringing around the Mound by the Sea Tavern, we will end it there. The humans of Dice Company would like to thank the following sweethearts for their support. Stephen Secora, Nori Goslaw, Mickey Arnold, Happy Daddy Scotty, Tika, SJ Fionix, Richard Ungermas, Rabbi Camel, Harris Pakar, Path Pursuit, Julia Zeno, Shovels, Mama Strange, Queenie, Liz Beckett, Axel Runholm, Shay Benton, and Chris from North London. Thanks for listening. Now over to our town crier, Alex, for an update on the Dice Company universe. Hello. In in light of Tox, I find this to be acceptable. Uh, we asked about people's catchphrases, and Bad Quail Games said, My old DCC character, a champion of chaos named Bjorn, who eventually transformed into a giant psychic crab, would often say, This is perfectly normal, while staring down the most batshit, boshian nightmare imaginable. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously a game. You, you could argue I should ask for more information, like who eventually turned into a giant psychic crab. I just let it go. Perfectly normal. That feels like the kind of thing that would be interesting to know more about. I've seen it happen enough times to know what the troop yeah. steps were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we asked, have you ever had a player versus player fight in your TTRPGs? Uh, Chip <laughs> said yes several times, including a few fatalities. And then in quotes, how much damage does the ogre do when using the halfling as a club? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Volpone said, We had one PC versus PC. It ended with the Dwarf Barbarian nat 20 ing an intimidation check against a crit one for my brother's Asimar Rogue. My dwarf almost turned that Asimar into a hand puppet. <laughs> <laughs> Nuremberg Trial 2 End the Boogaloo. Wow, well, what name? Uh, said, RPG no, but having a game of diplomacy descend into a fist fight, yes. Anyone played diplomacy? Should it end in a fist fight? Uh, yeah, quite famous for being, um, I wouldn't say fistfights. Most of the time it's played by male for exactly that reason. Fair enough. Onjul Raz said, As an intelligent person that loves to play stupid characters, I'm proud to say I've caused at least three in-party fights. And now to the big news of the week. We are proud to announce, for the first time ever, merchandise. Pretty sure people have thought about that before, haven't they? Ooh. <laughs> My God! <laughs> Fucking <laughs> hell! <laughs> I literally gave you guys a script that says reaction from the team. <laughs> that oh, was you? fucking useless, the lot of you. One second, I one second. Ooh. What do you want from me? My cat grabbed the back of my cloak. Kill the cat! <laughs> <laughs> that takes time. It really shouldn't. It's a very small creature with a brittle neck. Okay, no, 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 I can confirm. <laughs> I've looked back. He does say, okay, gasp! Um, right, do it, say merch again, Dom, and we're all going to underform. And for the first time ever, merchandise! Sacred blur! <laughs> Woo! Why? <laughs> uh, yeah, the footnotes don't say what kind Why of reaction ever would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow worse. Somehow worse. <laughs> that was Not worse. very clear direction in our defence. <laughs> <It's> just... Oh. <laughs>
Yeah, bad director blames his atrocious actors. <laughs> Neither won any Audioverse Awards. You can see why we didn't sweep the board in the old Audioverse Awards, can't you? Don't get me started. We're sorry, Audioverse. We're just bitter and lonely, I guess. We're never going to enter it again. And we haven't got time to enter again. I, I lost my mid-30s trying to fill in their form. And when we meet, and I assure you we shall... <laughs> All right, enough, <laughs> enough positive reactions now. <laughs> oh, Fucking hell. So good, I peed a little. I, I don't know. And be one of the first to own your very... <laughs> I to be the first to own your first mug. <laughs> You're a mug. Sorry. Be the first ahead. to ever drink coffee. Is there anything for that? Uh, who's that fourth character on Dice Company? What's his name? Vanda. Yeah. Shut up. Oh, Rosalind. <laughs> so Lenny. Rosalind. Lenny. <laughs> Shut up. There's actually loads of characters, though. Yeah. Difficult to remember them all. I was doing a thing. Who? Harry, answer. You don't... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> don't read the stage directions. Why isn't he answering? <laughs> Shut up. I didn't read the stage directions. Did you know that... C.S. Lewis and Tolkien were in a book club together with a third writer whose name I don't know. Yes. But the fact will make that clear. The third writer obviously didn't write anything nearly as famous as the other two. And can you imagine being the third person in the book club? Uh, the book club's name was The Inklings, and I've been to the pub in Oxford where they used to meet and sat at their table. I was going to finish my fact with, I bet you know what it's like to be that third person. <laughs> 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 Thanks for the save, though. Of course, he's not using the dream pillow, Dom. Ridiculous. Exactly. How could you even sleep? How silly of me. I'm so <laughs> sorry. This is a this is a butter kiwi situation, not a dream pillow situation. Exactly. He does butter the kiwi he uses to make the adjustments, of course. And I was looking up, so I've been keeping a calendar. I'm putting us at the sixth at the moment. Spot on. Awesome. Oh um, shit, how are you doing that? Holy shit, that's really awesome. Lore. Thanks for listening. Please consider supporting Dice Company on Patreon, where for the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to a whole other show, Extra Roll, as well as an ad free listening experience. The Dice Company Discord server, along with our socials, can be found on our link tree in the show notes. If you enjoyed this chapter, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to recommend us to your friends. If you didn't like it, recommend us to your enemies. And we'll see you next time on Dice Company. Dice Company.